Hi, and welcome, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here with you at the DevOps stage. Today, we're going to talk about keyless cloud deployments and GitHub Actions with workload identity using OIDC. And instead of just introducing OIDC like many resources online, I'd rather do more than uh, scratching the surface and rewind back in time to the origin story of authentication journey and add some context. Because, hey, even the best punchline isn't that funny without context, right? OK, let me introduce myself. My name is Kosela, aka Cloud Dude. I'm a founder and principal consultant at Cloud Thrill. I've lived more than a decade, almost two decades now, uh, in IT and Oracle Tech. I've been DBA for a long time until I transitioned into Minty Cloud DevOps and AIC uh, the last five years. Uh, there's not much more to add than uh, I'm a huge cloud and automation fan. And I share all my labs and discoveries on my blog and GitHub repos. That's uh, github.com slash brokedba. And also co-founder of uh, Tyco, uh, which is a Toronto AI and cybersecurity organization. We have uh, one meter per month. Uh, and I'm the host of uh, Tech Beats and Plug podcast since a year, which I'm very excited about. Um, you can uh, find a cool episode where I hosted Kelsey I Tower chilling about uh, DevOps for almost two hours. So uh, please check it out. That uh, type of content uh, speaks to you. Uh, right. So now that we're done with the intro, let's get to the reason why we're all here today, right? OK, uh, let's start with a meme. Of course, there are many expectations when you use CI CD to deploy in the cloud, right? Some go all in. Uh, they got everything figured out. And others, like our friend Anakin here, meh, not so much. Why? Because deploying to the cloud doesn't mean you're security savvy by default, which is true. but. Not necessarily OK, right? Uh, but the good news is it's never too late to improve because we have a lot of tools nowadays uh, that can help you do better things a better way, right? OK, so um, in terms of agenda, just a heads up, uh, there's actually a blog version of this presentation that has way more detail. So check out the QR code here. Uh, so what are we uh, talking about today in the agenda, though? Uh, well, first, uh, a small introduction on available cloud authentications and why it's wrong. In section two, we'll explore life before uh, and after OAuth protocol uh, creation, including terminology and the workflow. And in section three, uh, I'll dive into OIDC and what it brings um, on the table uh, on top of OAuth, uh, as long as the, the workflow, some additional concepts, uh, the tokens, et cetera. In the last part, we'll describe how IDC is using GitHub Actions and the available methods for each provider, being uh, GCP, Azure, AWS. Uh, but we'll do a little focus in our demo on AWS, uh, obviously. And finally, a Q&A, if we have time. <laughs> but before we start, I want to draw your attention on few numbers when uh, talking about secret sprawl. Uh, in GitHub's, thanks to a, a report from uh, GitGuardian, uh, where uh, in 2023, there was more than 12 million credentials accessible from GitHub. That's seven out of every thousand commits to GitHub spilling secrets, putting applications and businesses at serious risk. Uh, this is the shocking truth uh, exposed every year, which makes it clear that the, the hardcore secrets scattered across environments are becoming one of the biggest, if not the biggest threat for enterprises, users, and even states. Um, and these incidents don't just hit small businesses, but also big corporations like Uber, NVIDIA, LastPass, Samsung, uh, you name it, Dropbox, even Okta, that's supposed to be specialized in authentication, right? <laughs> Crazy. And more than 90% of these secrets remain valid five days after being leaked. Five days is a long time for hackers continuously um, monitoring GitHub, right? But guess what? <laughs> Toyota customer data was compromised with credentials exposed for five years. Five literal years. I'm not kidding. With access data uh, of more than 300,000 customers. That's insane. That's really crazy. And the uh, usual suspects are obviously cloud credentials, uh, uh, Google API secrets in number one, with over 1 million uh, occurrences for the, its secrets. And then we have 250,000 Google Cloud keys and 140,000 AWS IAM secret keys, right? That's huge. 
But hey, <laughs> there's more because now we have also people developing on top of AI. And guess how many open AI credentials are spread in GitHub every month? 46,441 API keys uh, occurrences leaked each month in 2023. Not to mention hug and face credentials as well, because people actually load their models from hug and face now in, in their pipelines, right? But that's enough, okay? I'm, I'm done with horror stories. Uh, but what are the popular cloud authentication standards, though, when we want to have access to the cloud? Well, traditionally, connecting to cloud platforms from uh, GitHub or anywhere involved using either user or machine uh, workload principle, as, showed, uh, as shown here, uh, you got the user base with the uh, interactive login for GCP and Azure or the access keys for AWS, but this stays uh, static credentials. Uh, and then you got the service principles uh, where you have this, uh, the account key file, service account key file for GCP or service principle password. It's still static type of uh, credentials. And then we have the instance principles uh, for your EC2 VM, for example, also called managed identities. Well, the thing with these uh, type of identities in our case with GitHub Action is that uh, you would need a self-hosted runners uh, running on your cloud, right? So it's dynamic, obviously, but it will need to run in your cloud. And then you got the assumed roles. I call them semi-dynamic, uh, and I'll explain why. And uh, one of the examples are uh, is the app role from HashiCorp Vault, right? But why are these authentications wrong or risky in GitHub? Um, well, simply because short-lived is good and static uh, or uh, long-lived is bad, right? Because, for example, static credentials, they never expire, right? They stay there forever. And that increases the vulnerability surface in case of leaks, right? So like, you're never safe once they're leaked. And then you got a lot of management overhead because you need to, to manage the storage of these credentials, the rotation, and that's that's a lot of work for your ops team, right? And even the cloud instance principle, as I explained earlier, um, the thing is the self-hosted runners will need to play in every of your cloud if you have a multi-cloud uh, environment where you want to deploy to every cloud, right? Which is an overkill, right? And even the dynamic secrets that I talked about, I said, see me, dynamic, uh, like app vault, uh, app role for uh, vault, they require static credentials to enable the feature, right? You know, to have access to AWS secret engine, you would need to give that secret uh, uh, to to your vault, right? So all of these are making things hard, you know, to, to you know deploy uh, safely, right? So uh, now that we actually explained, we've got the why it's wrong covered. Uh, let's get back to the Stone Age before OIDC or before OAuth, right? Uh, remember Farmville and Facebook, for those who are uh, old enough? <laughs> well, in the old days, apps like Farmville required your Facebook username and password in order to play forever. So you're not only let, letting them uh, access your account once, but they can keep the credentials forever. And that's like even a shady dude, your apartment key, hoping he want to throw a crazy, a wild party and then make copies for his friends and uh, come back country one day, right? That's, uh, that's kind of Airbnb, though. <laughs> anyway, it's insane, right? This is insane. Why? Because you pay to play and you bring to yourself risks and a bunch of risk. Uh, one of them is impersonation. Someone may pose as the user, right? Uh, and request the resource, you got phishing attacks, uh, you got app uh, with full scope access uh, to your account or resources. I don't know if you remember, but these application, uh, similar to Farmville, not really Farmville, they could write in your Facebook wall back in the days. They can text your friends, right? I don't know if you remember too, but me, I uh, used to have every week uh, one of my friends uh, just uh, posting in his wall, telling everybody in his network, hey, please, I've been hacked. Uh, please don't interact with the uh, the post this week, uh, especially those uh, with su suggestive pictures, right? So it's it's kind of insane. It was really the, the wild, wild west uh, back in the days. So the question is, how to let a uh, third-party app access user data without giving up your user uh, and password, right? Well, that's exactly what OAuth came to address using delegation. So delegation is a secret weapon. Why? Because uh, OAuth, for example, it eliminates the need for a password share, right? No more password flowing left and right. And it also allows granular access level through the scope 
no more full access. You get read, write, very selective type of access. And the apps would receive short leaf authentication, no more um, long leaf secrets, right? To the, uh, ac to the target data, right? And this is done through delegated access with uh, simple user consent, right? So delegation is a process in which an owner authorizes a service provider to perform tasks or access resources, you know, uh, on the owner's behalf. And uh, Google, uh, for instance, went even further because Google has zillion services. We all know Gmail, YouTube, Google Drive, et cetera, uh, before it kills it. <laughs> so instead of having authentication in, in each of their apps, they redirected all their apps login URLs into a single OAuth endpoint portal endpoint, and that's accounts.google.com. As you can see here, right, when you connect to your YouTube, uh, logging into your Gmail, you're not really logging into your Gmail, you're logging into accounts.google.com portal. And then once you have confirmed the access, boom, it will redirect you redirect you to the surface uh, in question. You have a read-only, a read-write type of scoped access, and you can revoke access anytime. So it's really, really practical, right, using the delegated access. So we said uh, that the OS2 is a, an authorization framework that allows third-party application to access HTTP service on behalf of a, a resource owner via the consent, the user consent. But let's talk a bit about terminology, though. So in OAuth uh, terminology, we have something called actors or roles, right? We have OAuth roles, right? And uh, we have four here. So one of them, the first one is resource owner. Resource owner is you. Right or the owner of the identity, the data, the resources, etc. Right, uh, this is uh, the resource owner. Right, and then you get the client or the application. That's actually the application that wants to use your resources uh, on behalf of you or on behalf of uh, the resource owner. Like for example, GitHub Action would have would need to use a resource on behalf of an account and cloud provider. Right, and then you have the authorization server. Uh, the authorization server is a service that manages resource owner authorization in the target platform. It could be like Active Directory. So it decides if uh, you have the right to use the resources on behalf of the, uh, the owner or not, right? And after that, you get the resource server. That's like the target uh, resource that the application wants to have access or, or, or manage on behalf of uh, the owner that is allowing to use manage. Uh, uh, resources. Uh, so it could be like Azure API, GCP API, AWS, or any any cloud provider, or even uh, on-premise or any uh, any endpoint, API endpoint uh, for that matter. So uh, oftentimes, you, you can have the authorization server and the resource server in the same location, uh, for example, in the cloud and uh, Google or, or, or AWS. But sometimes uh, you may have the authorization server stored somewhere else and uh, like in separate location than the resource server. Say you delegate the, the, authentication, the authentication to Okta, but you have your resource server in-house, right? So Okta takes care of the authorization, but you still have your resources hosted in-house, right? These are the cases where uh, it can happen. Now, in terms of uh, client types, uh, the criteria here is whether or not secret retention is possible. You get the public client and the confidential client. So the public client is everything web uh, related, right? It's a web page, browser, single page app, JavaScript, also mobile apps as well. And the problem with these type of client is that they're too open to keep a secret, right? Why? Because I can click right on a browser and uh, hit view source, and I could have access to whatever that is in the code, including a secret if it, if it ever was there, right? And even if it's a mobile application, right? You can you, what you can do is you can decompile the mobile app package, right, and have access to whatever code that that's inside, right? So it's not really secure or uh, a way of of uh, retaining the the uh, secrets. And then we have the confidential servers, right? So the confidential client, I would say. So confidential client is a server environment. That's your uh, uh, application server that runs .NET, Java. And the, the particularity of these, uh, these endpoints is that uh, these clients is that it can hold secrets, right? Why? Because uh, it's actually not in a, in a browser. It's not in a package, right? So your code is actually running in a trusted environment. This is why it's safe uh, to actually put the, the uh, secrets 
oh, to the, it can really hold the secrets in there, right? This is why these two also form a different type of channels, right? You got the uh, back channel um, from the confidential clients. Why? Because it's server to server kind of communication that can hold a secret, right? And we also have the front channel that we talked about, the public client, where um, it's more like a web to uh, server and you cannot actually securely contain uh, uh, credentials, right? Okay, so, but where do we start with OAuth, right? How does that happen, right? Day one. So the first thing you need to know uh, is that you need to register your application, right? Application registration on day one is necessary. And this is done through the authorization server to build future relationship, right? Uh, future exchange between the client and the authorization, authorization server. As you can see here on the right side, uh, we have uh, uh, actually uh, GitHub when bringing new application in order to authenticate using OAuth, right? Uh, you can see here that if you have the application name, the homepage URL, those are all option eventually, application description. And then you have uh, the most important info, which is the redirect URI or callback URI. So what is uh, redirect URI? Well, callback URI is where the authorization server redirect a resource owner back to after consent. So after consent, you need to send that owner somewhere else, which is the application, you know? And uh, once that is done, the authorization server will give you two things, the client ID and the client secret, right? The client ID is just the identity identifier of your application uh, within the authorization server, which can go through a uh, front channel because it's not really a, a, a secret uh, or a credential. And then you got the client secret. Client secret is a password given to the authorization uh, ser uh, that gives a, that is given to the, uh, the, the client from the authorization server for private future exchange, right? And for a few more concepts though, uh, we talked about scopes. So we have the scope that is just the type of permission that the client wants, such as access to data, perform an action, and grant types. Uh, so most common is the code. So authentication code is one of the grant types, which is just uh, what the client expects from the old server for future access requests. you got the consent of the owner uh, in order to let uh, the client uh, to use its uh, uh, resources on its behalf uh, by informing the auth server. And then, as I said, the grant type authorization code uh, for in the future access requests. So the client will exchange with the auth server uh, the, auth the authorization code in order to get the access token. This is why the authorization code is needed. And then we get the state. The state is a actually very interesting information because it's a random stream generated by the app, not by the auth server, which allows to confirm that the auth server reply was not forged. Because during that exchange, at some point, the client would need to know in the reply of the auth server if the auth server is legit. Uh, so there was no man in the middle. There was no interception. Uh, so this is created by the client in order to make sure it's really talking to the right auth server, right? And then you got the access token. Um, which is the uh, holy grail and the refresh token that is done through uh, the auth server whenever the uh, short-lived uh, uh, access key is actually expired. Okay, so this is just an example of a typical payload during the exchange between the client and the auth server. I told you about the uh, the, uh, the the code. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, we have an API request. We have the grant type, uh, the scope, the client ID, the client secret. Uh, obviously, this goes through a back channel, server to server, because we have the authentication code. And this happens when the uh, clients or application request for the access token. So once uh, the authorization server checks and everything uh, is valid, uh, then you have the final answer from the authorization server, uh, right, which is uh, containing the access token, uh, the short-lived access token. As you can see here, you have the expires in, you got the scope and then the refresh token, uh, uh, et cetera. So if you want to play with OAuth or OIDC workflow, there's an excellent playground you, you can use from OAuth uh, in this link, oauth.com slash playground. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting and, and informative. You want to know each uh, step. But uh, 
I, I just want to show you how OAuth works uh, here through the workflow. So we talked about the, the actors earlier. Uh, so we got the client, the resource server, the owner, the authorization server, right? Uh, and this happened, for example, let's say we take the application that's uh, your client is Yelp.com, right? So the first payload that is sent uh, from the client uh, or the application uh, to the OAuth server contains a information like the redirect URI, as I told you about, uh, that is done during the app registration, the uh, the grant type, which is code, the scope, which is the resource that I want to access. Here, the resource is contacts.google.com, uh, right? As you can see it in the resource server. And then you got the state, the random value, and the client ID. And this goes through a uh, front channel because it's not really uh, confidential. And there's no secret in it. And at that point, uh, the auth server shows the account portal to the owner in order to give the consent, right? So if it's a yes, the owner is redirected to the app URL uh, with uh, the code, right? That is sent to uh, the client back, right? So it's back, a redirect to uh, the application with the authorization code, right? And then after that, the client uh, would send another payload, right? that would contain the code, the client ID, the client secret, the grant type, right? So with all these information, uh, the authorization server could confirm that the consent was given to which scope, uh, from which owner to which application, right? Once that is done, uh, the uh, access token is given back, right? So step five here, you got the token, the access token that is given back to the application, Yelp.com. And once the access token, the short leave access token is given to the client, the client is going to send the last payload to the resource server because it wants the contacts.google.com, wants the list of contacts. So it gives the uh, access token through the back channel. It talks to the resource API, you know, as you can see here in the header, the, uh, the get uh, API call. And that at that point, the client will, will have access or like, attain whatever uh, content it wanted in the beginning, right? But we are talking about OIDC today. So what is OIDC, right? We've been talking about OAuth, but what is OIDC? Well, uh, OIDC is just an authentication protocol built on top of OAuth2 that adds the identity layer uh, on top of it, right? So it provides the user information, brings way more metadata. It enables clients to establish the login session, right? So the OAuth2 provides more access delegation via scoped access. It takes care of the auth Z, right? That's delegation. And the OpenID Connect is just the authentication part uh, and SSO on top of OAuth uh, authorization, right? So in order maybe to summarize, uh, so OAuth gives the application a way to make API requests to the resources, the API uh, resource server. And the OpenID brings uh, just the informa additional information about the user, ID, name, email, et cetera, like brings more information about who is behind the request, right? Uh, to put this into perspective, let's say you go uh, and check in in a hotel lobby, for example. You go there, uh, you show up, you show your ID and credit card, and then the receptionist, let's say it's authorization server, gives you back a key card. Key card is an access token, right? And then you take that card and go to the room. You swipe, swipe it on the door, that's the resource API. And then the door will open. See, the door doesn't need to know who is using the key card as long as you have the key, right? This is delegated access. It, it doesn't need to, and it cannot actually know who is entering the room, right? Anyone can enter with that card, right? So, well, OIDC brings exactly this last piece of the puzzle into the table by providing more information about who is behind the door with that access card. I hope it was a bit clear. So what's added with OIDC? As we said before, it's user info endpoint, right? So you can get information like ID, name, email. That's what OIDC provides. Uh, and then you got the ID token. So ID token is the core uh, sort of uh, content uh, or component of OIDC as it contains the information about the user who signed, uh, which is provided uh, to the client which is the application. So this token is encoded in a uh, uh, and signed using uh, JSON web token format. People call it JOT. Don't ask me why. 
which is readable by the client, right? And something you need to remember here with YDC flow is that we no longer have one token. We have two types of token. We have the ID token that's provided uh, by the client to the auth server, and we have the access token. While the OAuth used to just have the access token being given back uh, to the client after request, right? And then we have a set of scopes and standardized implementation as well, right? He's a, there's a, here's a, an ID token example. As you can see here in the gel token, uh, you got the header, you got the payload with the claims. As you can see here, you got the issuer, that's accounts.google.com, the subject, the name, the uh, audience, uh, the expiration, the issuance time, et cetera. And then you got the signature. Right. This is what is contained. Oh, you may have more clamps, but this is more or less the format of the token that is sent to the OS server during that exchange. So in terms of workflow, uh, we explained the OAuth workflow earlier. OIDC is not really different from OAuth. Right. The only difference here is the scope uh, uh, in the first payload, right? Uh, which is open ID profile, as you can see it here, uh, highlighted in red. Uh, right, so instead of the usual profile, there's open ID profile very specific to OIDC, but the rest is the same, right? With the consent, the redirect, right, to uh, uh, the client using the uh, rollback URL, right? And one of the other difference here is that on top of all the information that are sent in the exchange, uh, meaning uh, code, uh, client ID, client secret, grant type, you also have the ID token. Right, because the this ID token is necessary for the auth server to confirm the identity layer, right? In order to give back the access token, and then after that, the rest is the same. The rest of the flow, uh, the access token is used by Yelp.com to have access to uh, a profile pictures, for example, right, of your Google account. So uh, OIDC and GitHub Actions now. So we explained OAuth, we explained OIDC. <clears throat> But how does OIDC work in GitHub Actions? Well, it's more or less the same. OIDC allows GitHub Actions workflow to access resource in your cloud provider using short lift tokens for each pipeline execution. Like a workflow could be identified and can run and have a dedicated or meshed access and directly, directly from, from your cloud provider, right? And the important thing to know here is that um, ID token, however, uh, is managed by GitHub's identity provider, not by the cloud provider, right? So everything is done at that at that part, at that uh, time from within GitHub, right? And not from the cloud provider. And the main benefits are uh, first, stimulus authentication with cloud providers with zero secrets. So you have no more secrets to manage. Uh, you got no duplication of these secrets from GitHub to your cloud providers, like no deduplication of uh, uh, secrets, no secret sprawl. They're not scared anywhere. Uh, and there's no management, like you don't have to rotate to store them, et cetera. Uh, and it also enables admins to rely on providers IAM for least privileged access. So you can be as granular as you want using the IAM from your cloud provider. If it has to be like one, uh, uh, availability is on one VM, one subnet, or one specific resource. You can have that kind of access too uh, with o OIDC, right? So uh, in order to summarize, using OIDC and Workload Identity Federation, which we also call WIF, uh, this will bring maximum security, minimum maintenance, because you won't have that overhead of managing the rotation, uh, storage of your secrets, et cetera which is win-win for everyone, to be honest, All right? So how does that work in terms of step? We already talked about day one. Day one is the app registration, right? So this, this is the first step you would need, uh, setting up the OIDC trust in your cloud provider. And this happens through uh, configuring GitHub's OIDC as a federated identity, uh, then attach whatever IAM role necessary map to that workload identity. And after that, you can start updating your workflow with the right action in order to authenticate using ID token from GitHub, right? The workflow is pretty simple as well, right? As we can see here, we have the RDC trust that was done. They want app registration inside the providers on the left side um, uh, that's required. And once that done, you can start to use your uh, workflow in GitHub Actions pipeline, right? Uh, so step one would be your action workflow requesting 
the OIDC token from your OIDC provider, which is the GitHub ID provider. And once the ID provider from GitHub will give back that to your action, your pipeline uh, will actually send the ID token, OIDC token, plus the role to assume, right? Once it, it sends these kind of information, the authorization server within the cloud provider will confirm that OIDC identity matches uh, it exists in the cloud provider and also is attached to the same type of role that you're claiming uh, in your request. Once that relationship trust is confirmed, it provides back a short-lived access token to actions workflow. And then your pipeline from then could use it in order to have access to the resources within your cloud provider. As we said, it could be AWS, Alibaba, Oracle Cloud, Google, Azure, you name it. Right, so this is more or less how it works to the GitHub Actions. Uh, As so we can talk now about each different provider. Um, but before that, yes. So while defining the OIDC trust um, is uh, might be easy for some providers, uh, you may have mixed up claims causing the cloud SDS not to recognize your GitHub pipeline. So. How to fix that? Well, the best way to confirm the claims in your ID token when it doesn't work or with as a mismatch is through uh, an awesome, awesome tool that is called OIDC Debugger. This is just an action that you can run with any workflow, like a, a bare workflow, uh, just in order to make sure you didn't make any mistake, right? So it will just give you, for example, this is an excerpt of my own repo claims, right? I turn my, I run this workflow uh, pipeline for my repo. And then you can see here that you have the standard claims, issuer, uh, the audience, uh, the issuer, and then the subject. As you can see here in the audience, you have the actor, you got the audience, uh, you have the environment. This is actually an environment that I created for uh, a GCP uh, workflow in order to deploy through uh, Terraform, and it's linked to a branch. Uh, you also got the issuer that's very specific to GitHub here. So it's token.actions, GitHub's user content.com. And uh, then you have the reference. So the ref, it's more about which branch you're using here. For example, the ref type if branch, uh, the branch is git actions. The repo is broke DBA slash Terraform examples, right? And you got the subject. So the subject usually is the fastest way to create your workload federated identity linked to your GitHub action or any other um, web identity, actually. Because you can see here in the subject that it contains my repo, which is broke DBA Terraform examples. But then I can add the environment. I told you earlier that my environment is linked to the branch, so I don't need to use any repo ref uh, in my claim when creating my identity if I just use the uh, subject, because it's really containing everything, it's super compact. And you can see here that you have the workflow as well uh, because I run the, the token. So you can also extract the workflow name. Even the workflow can have uh, a matched uh, uh, identity, right? So first example, I just described how it works in Azure, uh, but it's more or, the, more or less the same everywhere. So you set up your IDC trust in Azure by creating a workload identity federation uh, for uh, GitHub Actions, so you whiff through something called the uh, Active Directory Application Registration. Once that's done, while well, GitHub Action Workflow requests the ID token for uh, the external identity, which is GitHub uh, ID provider, so the external identity can like relate it to the cloud provider, right? But within GitHub, it's still like an internal identity provider. So once that is done, you got the ID token that is provided back in step two, and then after that, the pipeline would just send the ID token plus the request uh, of the access token to, to Azure, right? Uh, authorization server. And then the authorization server or AD will check or Entra will check the trust relationship and validates uh, the ID token. And after that, if everything checks out, it gives back the access token. And from that, your pipeline could deploy, uh, could destroy, could manage, could update uh, using Terraform or using uh, CLI or SDK, whatever you want. So this is just the explanation of what I, I, I just said in text. Uh, so you would require within your workflow uh, uh, an action called login. And then after that, when you when the pipeline is sending a request, uh, so with the ID token, Azure ID verifies the claim against the federated workload uh, identity. 
info and if everything matches it gives the access token so it can start deploying or managing resources using the access token uh so within your uh workflow how it works is you would once that trust is done is created the identity identity is created in, uh, in azure you would need to use uh, an action called azure login and there are three uh, required parameters. And you can see here in these input parameters, you have the client ID, which is the principal associated with the, the federated identity. You get a tenant ID uh, that is associated also to the uh, your workload identity, the federated identity, and the subscrip subscription ID. So none of these informations are secrets, right? These are more like metadata because the, the identification of your workflow or your uh, your workload is within the pipeline itself, right? These are just additional uh, data, but they're not secrets, right? And the prerequisites are setting up the RDC trust, as I said before, in the cloud provider, uh, the that federated, ID, federated identity need to exist. And you also need to set the permission of the ID token equal to right. Why? Because ID token permission uh, is right as... Uh, it's the only way for the action to create a JOT token, the ID token, right? So if you want to create an ID token to send it to the cloud provider, you need to have that permission to set to write. But you don't necessarily need to put it at workflow level. It could be just the job where you need the access that you uh, set this uh, parameter to write. And as an example here, say you're in, within your workflow, uh, you call the action that is called Azure slash uh, login at v1 you can see here that i used client id tenant id subscription id as secrets but I, it's not necessary as i said uh the identity is within the workflow right if you are in a private repo you can put variables if you want to uh right but i'm security freak so i use everything through secrets uh but this is more or less how it works like all these informations are just metadata you send it there is no secret to manage in your environments, you can scan as much as you can. There would never be any access key or password that is detected, right? It always is more or less the same. I'm just going to focus on step five here where you can see that uh, uh, the, the STS from uh, the IAM AWS STS will just confirm the verify the token allowed to assume the requested role, right? And Shen, after that, we'll just give back the short leave uh, uh, access token to your pipeline, right? Same thing here. Um, it has a special name. So in your workflow, you got to define the, the action. And then at some point, step five, AWS will validate your, your ID token and also the requested role uh, that is supposed to uh, match that identity before sending the access token. Uh, within your workflow, as I said, you always have the input parameters. These are not secrets. Uh, with regard to AWS, you would need the role to assume, right? As you can see here, it's just the web identity role, uh, just the RN number once you create the, the role for your, your identity. Uh, and then you have the role session name, the default GitHub uh, action. So it could be just plain text if you want to, and the AWS region that is known to everyone, right? It's like public content. Uh, the prereqs are the same. So as uh, an example here, you can see what I used here as, because uh, I created one for every cloud provider so far, three of them. The role to assume, I put that as a secret just because I wanted to, uh, because my repo is public. But the role session name, I, I kept it to var because the default is known by everyone. Same thing for the AWS region, right? It was set in my environment. Uh, so... For Google, I didn't want to explain the workflow, but they have the action. And here, you got only two input parameters, right? It was harder for me to create the workload identity because they have two ways of doing it, using principle and principles, right? So you got to make sure like you're not getting mistaken when you use your claim. But anyway, the first uh, parameter is workload identity provider, which is the full ID of uh, your uh, workload. Cloud IDP, the format is more or less projects, number, location, global, workload, identity pool. You would have to create that pool. I call it a GitHub pool and then provider, uh, name the provider. Then you got the service account, which is just the email address of the GCP service account. Uh, prereqs, pretty much the same. 
Uh, so the action is called Google GitHub action slash auth v1. As you can see here, I used workload identity provider as a secret. Same thing for the service account. Token format is not really necessary because the default value is access token. So we're good. And um, right now, I think uh, it's time for uh, our demo. Um, you got the block version here, so you can scan uh, the QR code when I'm uh, looking for that page with the the example. Uh, we're just going to um, sift through uh, the otherwise example because we don't have time to uh, try all the uh, providers. But I'm just going to give you a small example. So this is this is actually the uh, the action itself, right? You can go at, uh, to AWS Actions Configure AWS Credentials, right? But I'm gonna talk to you about the day one action, right? You need to create the, uh, establish the trust. How do we do that? We go to the console of AWS. We try to create um, the identity provider, which is an OIDC identity provider. You can see here that I created it already, but in case you wanna create from scratch, you can do this, right? provide a name, uh, wait, you can go back here. See, I wanna copy it, for example. You can see that there are two uh, identities uh, format that I, I, I can choose from. You got the SAML, you get the Open ID Connect, right? So if you have Open ID Connect, it will always give you like the URL, you have to give the URL of the provider, right? And this is my provider, right? So I, and I have to, add it right after this. This is exactly what I did. When I click on it, you can see that uh, there's an RN that is uh, sort of uh, generated uh, after registering this uh, this uh, OIDC provider. And you got the audience, which is the old server that would have to check the ID token, uh, the OIDC token that is the default one, which is the Amazon AWS.com SDS. But here we created the identity, the, the identity provider, but there is no role attached to it, right? It, it cannot do anything, can be identified, but there's no authorization. So I go back to the roles. I need to create a new role. And here, uh, we'd have to select something. Uh, for example, here, my policy is full access to EC2, right? right? Right, full access to EC2. So this is more or less my policy, but then I have to sort of uh, add the link between this role, this is the assumed role, and the identity. So where do we do that? It's uh, uh, through editing the or creating the uh, trust relationship, right? The trust policy is this. So first, you you're define your principle, which is a federated web identity. You give the RN of your identity. And then in terms of action, it's assume role web identity. And the condition strings equal here. I'm just uh, sifting through the claims that I showed you in my ID token, right? So the audience is stsamazon.com, and then you got the the uh, the subject, right? The dot sub here, that is just the repo plus my environment, right? So it's pretty 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 simple with AWS. And let's go back to GitHub back to to our GitHub uh, uh, repo, right? So we have this repo in here. The branch is Git action, and my deployment is within AWS. And this is more or less create VPC. Uh, a subfolder with a Terraform config, uh, but then I need to create a, um, a workflow. So our workflow is in here. Again, pretty simple. I define a workflow uh, event trigger, which is a push. So anytime yeah, I commit, uh, then this, this will trigger. And then I define the path. So anytime I actually change anything within this folder with the TF extension, my pipeline will actually kick in. Right. And then we have some environments that's like the environment for Terraform. Then the stack there is just like the location, this exact location. Right. And if you want me to go uh, through the details here, maybe I can I can zoom in. But um, in order to be, yes. So here it's the same workflow, but I just want to explain to you uh, what it does at some point. I will. Uh, in the init, for example, I would just uh, run the, uh, the checkout of the repo and style Terraform, and then I want to run the init, as you can see here, init, Terraform format, validate, and then here, I would like to have the access. So I use that action I told you about. I use the role to assume. As you can see here, it's secret uh, session name. 
I just put like plain text because it's my session. You can give him anything. And then the region, which is a variable, right? And then I, I, I added like a small task, like a small um, sort of execution or a shell command through STS just to confirm that I'm logged in, right? And if you can see here that these two variables were created in the environment, you can see I created a new environment. I call it AWS Labs. And then I linked it to Git action branch. And then here I created my AWS role to assume as a secret. I could have done the environment variable, but fine. Here I got the region and the, the directory from where to run the config. That's what I needed to run, okay? And then so when we have these uh, done, I am on pipeline here. So if I come back here, my, my pipeline is supposed to do a Terraform in it, Terraform apply, Terraform destroy, right? I said that if I change anything within this one, if I put some columns in here, right? Let's say I'm coming back in the, not variables, but maybe, PPC, right? Just to tell you that I changed something. If I put column here, if I edit it real quick, I put a column here, I commit it. I'm in the right branch, right? I hit the push. You can see here that there's already a pipeline that is running, right? You got the update VPC. I got a pipeline running live, right? But since it's running already, I'm gonna just go back to the previous one just to show you, maybe it's fast enough, let's go. So if I go back here, I wanna focus, I want you to focus on the credential run. So like we have the Terraform in it, et cetera. So it's super, super fast, right? Nothing much uh, within my pipeline, right? You can get here, right? It's running and I get up to uh, not here. Right, so this is a configured AWS credentials. This is my action that would send the ID token to uh, AWS and checks if the identity exists and the assumed role matches, right? Role to assume, this is what I sent to my action, session name, the region, right? And if I go back to VPC, eventually you may have something being created, but maybe not yet, right? But anyway, so I had that sent and I get my token back, right? My access token, and then I get, a test. So my my uh, my small test is AWS STS get caller identity, right? So this would not have worked, right? If I was not logged in. So right after that uh, that uh, that action, I can actually log into my account through this workflow because the workflow has an identity with some uh, privileges in order to, you know, do something in in my cloud, right? Like it, it, it has an identity with uh, AWS. So this is what I printed. That's, that's the uh, the command. But if I go here, eventually it may create it because it's like an apply. Let me see. Right. Yeah, it creates the, the cache. But if I go back to uh, summary and the previous pipeline execution, you can see that at some point I do uh, the Terraform apply, right? by using that credential. And once I create the credential, I can run the Terraform apply, right? Same thing here, right? And then I could have that all done, right? It would, this Terraform would uh, execution, the apply would not work if I didn't have access to my AWS account. But instead of providing access key and access ID, I just provided the soon bro. And then uh, my SDS in AWS knew that my workflow, my pipeline had the right ID and the right uh, permissions, right? So maybe it's here yet, but anyway, so if it's not here, it's fine. Uh, but this is just to explain to you how it works. So it's really straightforward. It's seamless. Uh, there is no uh, a management overhead of uh, any secret. You can be, uh, your, your repo can be scanned. They will never find any secret, right? So this is more or less what I wanted to uh, explain with uh, this uh, little demo. I think uh, maybe the older one is still running, right? But anyway, that's more or less what I explained. So the apply is running right now. But in in the meantime, I uh, I thought it was uh, instructive. Let's go back to uh, uh, C. I think it's here. Probably going to be created, right? I'm just going to prove it to you. There you go. You see, so I just created my VPC, right through uh, 
uh, with all the everything, so network connection, route table, uh, subnet, etc., uh, through my Terraform config, just using uh, the ID token uh, from the uh, workload uh, federated identity I just explained through OIDC. So it's pretty straightforward, it's super easy, uh, really, really, really no brainer. Okay, now that we uh, we just saw the um, the demo, uh, we just like to. I think we're done. But I, I wanted to uh, share my socials. Uh, so here are they. You can reach out to me. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to help. And uh, as you can see, LinkedIn, blog version of this. Don't forget to scan the QR code. The GitHub repos, my podcast, Tech Beats Unplugged. My name is Casella. And uh, thanks again for having me. That was awesome. Thank you.